and welcome to the second activity organized by the research group on sexualities at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. On behalf of the group, I want to thank you all for being here today and uh, to attending this uh, round table. So uh, before we present our invited speakers for this round table around the uh, initiatives of anti-gender campaigns and policies within the European Union, I would like to briefly say a few words uh, for, about GPS for those who don't know yet. So uh, GPS, this is a recently founded research group on sexualities of uh, SESH, born from the will of a group of researchers, professors, and also PhD students, and uh, is uh, assumed uh, to have an intersectional length uh, following the inter, inter and transdisciplinary approach that uh, describes the work carry out in SESH, as uh, the majority of people may know. Uh, in order to uh, enable dialogues uh, with the SESH thematic lines and members of this uh, community. So this uh, research group is coordinated by Professor Anna Cristina Santos, Professor Madalena Duarte and Professor uh, Teresa Toldi. And uh, as um, the main focus, um, is research on sexuality studies. And topics of research uh, are very diverse, uh, such as harassment and other uh, forms of sexual violence, bisexuality, asexuality, LGBTI plus rights, queer methodology, um, amongst others. Uh, so basically GPS has uh, two main uh, objectives. For one side, to create space uh, for meeting and consolidation um, of research in sexuality uh, carried out within the scope of SESH. And the second objective is to give uh, SESH greater visibility and uh, projection in this area and opening dialogues with uh, uh, associations, organizations, uh, extending to civil society and of course, uh, media. So, we will put um, in the chat the link to assess the uh, website. Uh, so those who haven't done yet, please uh, have a look. And um, so, so um, for those of us who, who were in uh, charge of organizing this uh, cycle of um, initiatives, uh, Julia Garraio, Teresa Toldi, Gustavo Elps, uh, Pedro Fidalgo and myself. So we, when we were thinking about this um, initiative, we wanted to start um, uh, the research group activities by bringing this topic, the, bringing the topic of anti-gender campaigns to our uh, discussions. And um, it's why we, we prepared this, this uh, cycle of web webinars focused in Europe, but not also, also abroad other other sides of the uh, other geographies. So last February, we held our first uh, webinar dedicated to anti-gender campaigns, uh, explored from uh, lens coming from academia. We invited Professor David Paternote from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, who gave us some clues about common patterns of mobilization that can be observed uh, across borders, including shared discourses, repertoires of action, and similar strategies in Europe. So um, now, and because uh, tomorrow we celebrate the International Day Against uh, Homophobia, Biphobia, Interphobia, and Transphobia, we saw uh, it couldn't be more appropriate to organize uh, the second initiative of this cycle um, dedicated to uh, collective strategies of races or of resistance against anti-gender campaigns in the European Union. So today this, in this roundtable, 
we brought uh, together different political actors, including European policy makers and grassroots activists to debate the panorama of anti-gender uh, discourses and policies in the European Union and to shed light on ongoing resistance strategies and initiatives mobilized at various levels in different European countries, such as Hungary, Poland, and Portugal. So we believe that these types of discussions are crucial in a scenario where we could observe several black lashes and growing populisms of the so-called uh, far right, leaving gender and sexual uh, diversity uh, people under threat as well as institutions and activities promoting um, LGBTI plus rights. So um, I will know, now explain how this uh, roundtable is going to work and introduce our invited speakers. So without going any further, I will now present um, our first invited speaker, Bea Sandor from the Atter Society in Hungary. So Bea Sandor, is a law graduate and also holds an MA in Gender Studies from the Euro Central European University. She has been working in humans and LGBTI rights NGOs since 97. And she's, she has been working as a project coordinator and legal expert from Atter's Society's legal program since February, 2015. So uh, Bea, Thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation. Welcome. And so you can start whenever you, you want. So I didn't know that I would be the first, but I'm ready, luckily. So I'm, I'm trying to share my screen um, as soon as I can, because I made the presentation because I'm going to talk about a campaign that has happened recently. And I want to show you some, some of the images and some of, of the material used there. Hatter Society uh, is a national LGBTQI organization operating since 1997. So it's the, the oldest and, and largest one operating an information and counseling hotline, providing in-person counseling, legal aid service, HIV prevention. We have an archive and library. Uh, we provide research and training, work on legal advocacy, and also organize community and cultural events. Uh, so you can see that it's, uh, it has multiple tasks and links to the, both the community, to professionals, different uh, experts of, of various fields, and the general population. Uh, recently, since the uh, governmental attacks on the LGBTQI community and uh, human rights began. We have to work more and more on, on communication, and this is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, first about the context, uh, Hungary had a referendum uh, on the day of the national elections in early April this year, the 3rd of April. Uh, the, the, this referendum was proposed by the government which uh, basically wanted to respond to the European Commission's infringement procedure because of partly because of anti-LGBTQI legislation. And the government claimed that their aim is to show uh, to the European Union that Hungary, Hungarians will not allow LGBT activists to provide sex education in schools. Not that there have, uh, of course, this was uh, the, the, the uh, the covering text, uh, there hasn't been, th th there, there are programs that have provided sexual education or education related to human rights and partly sexuality, but not that many. Uh, it was mostly the government's campaign that really made it uh, uh, so, so visible. Uh, it was uh, an opportunity for them to thematize LGBTQI rights in the public discourse and mobilize the, the homo and transphobic part of the society for the general elections. So they basically wanted to reap a double harvest to, to mobilize people to go to the elections because of homo and transphobia. And also if they are there at the elections, uh, also uh, answer the completely absurd uh, questions of the referendum. Um, disguised as, as protecting, as, as related to protecting children in, in Hungary and in schools. 
um, I'm also adding to the context. Um, uh, it has been the, the right now we can regard it as, as the end of a several years long process. Of course, it is an ongoing process, but I highlighted a few points. A couple of years ago, gender studies was banned in Hungary. The president of the parliament made really strong uh, homophobic remarks. Uh, a consumer protection authority fined a company for posters depicting same-sex couples. The ratification of the Istanbul Convention was officially denied because using the argument that it uses the word gender, in uh, 2020, legal gender recognition was completely banned in Hungary and uh, single parent adoption, which made it possible for non-married uh, same-sex couples to adopt, was also basically made impossible. Uh, in 2021, um, uh, there was this a, a ban uh, in legislation, a ban on showing LGBTQI people for minors in all products and media content, in public service ads and in school programs. So the so-called popularizing of uh, homosexuality and transsexuality, as, as they use these words, uh, is, is, is banned. Uh, basically, very similar to the Russian Putinist uh, legislation. And then uh, in the, the referendum in this April also gave them a possibility to keep this up for months and months and months, repeating that this referendum is needed because Hungarians need to declare that they won't let, that they will protect children, all Hungarian children from uh, LGBTQI propaganda. Um, yes, so, um, I uh, also adding to the contest, the anti-gender arguments that they use are very well known, I think, in, in many of our countries. Uh, they use the terms gender lobby, they mention an attack on traditional values, traditional femininity and masculinity, which are which form the basis of society and how they say that children's socialization is uh, endangered by the LGBTQI uh, lobby and the gender, so-called gender lobby. Uh, the supporters of the, the so-called gender lobby are depicted as the West, the foreigners, foreign funded organization, the European Union, Brussels, uh, sometimes uh, th these can be replaced with different entities, sometimes the the communism is, is uh, also uh, referred to or Marxism as, as the enemy. Um, uh, also, they also uh, argue that women's place in the division of labor is in danger, there's a demographic crisis, and because of the LGBTQ propaganda, children must be protected. So all these areas, this, this so-called, in, in, in this anti-gender argumentation, all these are areas are interrelated and threatened and enemies need to be found and the propaganda, the so-called propaganda must be stopped. Um, what are actually under attack, under attack is gender, gender studies, the, the whole concept of, of gender and uh, the analysis of the social workings of, of gender, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, including birth control, adoption and reproductive procedures, uh, or the, the equal um, 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 possibility to, to, um, to use reproductive procedures. Comprehensive sexuality education, including prevention in schools, uh, prevent sexual prevention, violence prevention, and so on. Now that's completely, uh, basically banned in Hungary because nobody knows what the legislation, refer legislation refers to. So everybody's afraid of um, saying anything about sexuality in schools. And the equality and the rights of LGBTQI people is also under attack or even uh, basically uh, ruined. Um, and what, how they, what they do, uh, the strategies that the government uses are also very, very familiar, must be very familiar to, to many of you in various countries. Uh, they work on mobilizing, campaigning, like in this instance with this referendum, 
they spread disinformation, make use of divisions within movements, uh, want to oppose uh, trans organizations and women's organizations and uh, um, uh, create different fractions. Um, they um, link those who talk about gender to different power positions. Somehow there's always an enemy in power like the European Union or Brussels. Uh, they, what they also do is, is that they block international legislation, conventions uh, in the EU, EU or uh, the Council of Europe. They use uh, human rights and feminist language. That's also a common technique. For example, right now, the president of the state is a woman, and that is used as an argument that look how feminist we are, which is, of course, not the case. Um, I have talked about legislation, said instances of very negative legislation and even constitutional reform. Uh, they veto references to sexual uh, and reproductive health and rights in international norms. And they also support anti-gender organizations, uh, attack uh, civil society organization and harass activists uh, now and then, not as severely as as perhaps in, in uh, other countries, but still it has uh, started in, in the recent years. Um, so this is the context in which uh, a couple of civil society organizations began to work on, on a very uh, well-organized campaign, the strongest one up, up to now, uh, to against the referendum, which as I told, it, it uh, contained four questions, four kind of very mean, meanly homo and transphobic, but at the same time, really empty questions, um, which, are, which were, according to the LGBTQ movement, of course, are, are invalid questions. So the, the, the headline of the campaign was invalid answers to invalid questions. The campaign was about promoting uh, that people should give uh, an, an invalid response. For example, uh, making a double X's both say yes and no to the questions, because that, can, that was the only way to ensure that the answers are going to be counted as invalid. Um, so, uh, because the questions are so manipulative, uh, that was the only way to, to win, to invalidate the referendum. Uh, the campaign was led by Amnesty International Hungary and Hatter Society, but um, there were also altogether 14 civil society organizations that collaborated, various human rights organizations, uh, lots of LGBTQI organizations, of course, that uh, used their uh, media presence and, uh, and, and media surfaces to, to help the campaign. And uh, you can see the, the, the main, the, the, this headline sentence that, that we should give invalid answers to an invalid question and the double X. Um, and uh, the campaign was based on, on hope and value-based messages. So it was, there was a lot of thinking on, on how to persuade people to, uh, to do this very active step. Of, of giving invalid answers. And uh, we had to aim at uh, somehow rising general popular support. Um, so the, the main uh, uh, um, instrument of, of the campaign was to show uh, families and supporters, uh, friends, colleagues, family members, who talk about how they want their loved ones, LGBTQI people, to be safe and free from discrimination. Uh, there were four videos made, uh, <clears throat> 11 personal stories uh, shared uh, regularly and, and various uh, testimonies. Uh, so grandparents, parents, different families, friends, colleagues were involved. Uh, um, um, and uh, you can see one of, of the friends' couples on one of these pictures. And also the next, uh, uh, the, the other picture with this group of people takes us to the, another element of the campaign, 
uh, lots of cities and towns were visited by a group of uh, volunteers. Uh, in this previous picture, you can see this uh, small town setting with this, uh, the group of volunteers wearing these t-shirts and they talked to people and distributed materials. So th this led to more than 200 media appearances, uh, hundreds of volunteers joined in. There were also billboards used and stickers, posters and flyers uh, put everywhere with one uh, campaign bus. Uh, and there was also uh, here and there, now and then there were flash mobs. So it was uh, lots of activities that, uh, that mobilized uh, lots, of, lots of people, uh, supporters. And the result was an invalid referendum. Um, 1.7, 1 1.5 million people, people voted invalidly in all four questions. So they were really conscious people who wanted to express their support and, and, and uh, definitely consciously voted invalidly. So the, the referendum in this way did not reach the validity threshold. Uh, although those who did answer, the majority of them supported the government. Of course, the government won a huge majority in the general elections too. Um, but the, the, the referendum was invalid because uh, the, the valid answers did not reach uh, 50, the 50% 50 that was necessary. Um, and uh, what also is uh, something to mention is that while the Hungarian government spent 16 million United States dollars only on advertisements, only on, on social media advertisements, the civil society's campaign, which proved to be so successful, was made by, from uh, just a small, very small uh, part of that sum. Um, uh, $220, uh, and this, this was the entire budget with, with staff, design, material, and, and advertising. So, so it's incomparable, and still uh, it's something that gives hope that, that if there's a momentum, if there's something, uh, something very hands-on, something tangible to, to tell to people, and there's a well-organized campaign, and a bunch of people who work a lot on it, then it's, it's possible to, to persuade uh, people to, to say no. So that's what we've seen throughout the years, that actually as our communication is also getting stronger, um, although the legislation is worse and wor worse for LGBTQI people, but it doesn't mean that social support is lessening up to now, of course. So it's, uh, up to now it has even grown to some extent. So. Uh, we'll see what the future brings and how much the government is uh, going to spend and, and uh, work more and more on uh, anti-LGBTQI propaganda, uh, but that's for the future. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Bea, uh, Bea Sander, um, for so clear presentation. And uh, so now we'll move on to the next speech. Um, I, I would uh, ask for Dani Bento, Daniela Bento. And I will briefly present uh, also Dani, uh, 35 years old, born in Cartacho, but living in Lisbon. He's a LGBTIQ plus uh, law, so social justice and mental health activist with a degree in astrophysics and being a software engineer as a profession, she is part of the current board of Associação ILGA Portugal, as well as a coordinator of the Trans Reflection and Intervention Group, so-called GRIT, of the same association. She is part of the Trans Health Network and uh, the working group of, for the implementation of um, ECD 11, so the 11 revision of the international classification of diseases, to initiatives of transgender uh, Europe. So, Daniela, thank you for accepting our invitation and being with us. The floor is yours. 
Before all, <clears throat> before all uh, I want to thank you because this invite is very important to discuss activisms and the way that we um, we put the questions and the answers on the table. Uh, as we, as I was, I was mentioned, I, I'm a software engineer and uh, I'm from astrophysics. Uh, but I have my experiences all on ground activism. So I started in Ilga, Portugal in 2000, 2016. And I started as a coordinator of GRIT in 2015. And most of the work that we are doing in Ilga, Portugal is uh, on advocacy, on uh, protecting the community. At this moment, that is very important because all these COVID times and all the pandemic, and also the support to many places that needs from uh, information formation and etc grid itself is an interest group from from little portugal that the main objective is to help the community to engage in a political statement and to engage people for the community help uh, self-care and community care and in um, some other things so in here i i would like to to bring some some things that happened in the last few years in Portugal, uh, that were that were mainly um, things that happened after the new law. Because for the context in Portugal, we have also a self determination law that was that was published in two thousand eighteen. That law says that every Portuguese person above eighteen years old can change their sex and sex marker and, and name on the civil record. Uh, that was a, a big uh, change on on the procedure because before that we have a, we were we were, were obligated to have a requirement from the doctor, and this 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 new law uh, removed that that requirement. Uh, but at the same time, this law still has some problems because it not, does not comply with uh, for migrant people and does not comply for people that are less than sixteen years old. And don't don't ex, don't um, validate non-binary identity, so it is still is a problem. But for example, in that time, um, what we could see is that we have a lot of movements uh, against against this law, even inside the trans community, because the main the main reason of the trans community itself to to be against this law is the fear of losing the, all the all the medical procedures that are the, the, given by the state. Uh, that is not the case. That is that will not be ha happen unless our government makes a, lot, a step back on this. But uh, the idea is not to to bring uh, this idea down. But in that time it was very conflictuous because uh, we have a lot of feminist movements also uh, that bring a lot of questions like uh, trans people are using the capitalism way of working because they they want to uh, use the hospitals and the clinical support as a way of maintaining the, the capitalism vision of the world. Um, for example, another, another argument that has, is very used is that people um, are uh, trans um, therapy, hormonal therapy is like a conversion therapy because they assume that people trans people want to be uh, in reality heterosexual people. So they make these changes only to make themselves heterosexual people. This was, this was some of the arguments driven on that time. Um, I, also, um, I, problem. Also, um, in that, that law, it was expected that we have a, a, um, a, a, specified, a specification for what is the behavior of the, of the, the schools. And this law impl implies that the schools have, have to um, give the right to the children to go for the bathroom that they want, that they identify, and to be treated as a social name that they want, and to have this, all these uh, rights granted. But at, this, at the same time, there, there was a lot of uh, against movements. For example, um, we have a petition on the summer of 2000, 2019 that that um, wanted to go down with this 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 record from the law, saying that trans people are not don't exist, or we are pushing the engineering the ideology to the schools. One problem that we have is that we have a lot of doctors and themselves that are very transphobic, 
So that's not helping a lot of the movement itself, because, for example, in Portugal, what is happening is that almost the times that we have a trans person talking, we have always a doctor explaining what is a trans person. And for example, from my personal view, in this case, I think that while we are putting doctors explaining what, what are trans people inside, side to side with a trans people person, this will always, always pathologize into the people itself. And also we have uh, one campaign called that was promoting um, the, the, against the gender ideology inside the schools, avoiding the, the, current, the current idea that uh, people should be what they want to be. And in this sense, we have, we have a, um, I'm a little, the, the voice because I'm sick. <laughs> um, and, and we have a lot of, of these movements, but for example, what I understand in the, our association that we need in the last two years, we did a lot of community work because the pandemic gives, gives us this mixed opportunity because it, with this way we could get more people engaged to the, to the community group. But at the same time, it was very hard for most of the people because, for example, uh, before the pandemic, people um, were, they, they have a space to go. For example, people from Lisbon, they have a LGBT center that they, they can go and we make our meetings, support group there, etc. And with the pandemic, many people start to be uh, not having that space, safe space because they, they start to, to be in, inside the closet, inside house. And they suffer a lot of violence uh, with it. And this pandemic, this pandemic um, times also break up a lot of um, far right uh, uh, discourses. And this, this type of discourses also affect many because it's my main work is around community support. It also affect a lot of the people that are at this moment waiting for support in, in self-care and community care. Because mainly what is happening is that the people are taking the, the idea that they are not valid, they don't exist, and that they are sick, and they are, they are this type of things that passes from the, from this type of arguments. And with this, um, it's important to, to, to realize that, for example, when we are talking about uh, gender itself or, or, or um, gender itself like it is, sometimes we forgot that ma mainly the, our vision of the gender is something that is mainly created for by our system itself not not is not is not native that we have only a binary system etc etc so and at this point for example we have another problem that for example this type of movements that are against trans trans um trans issues they forget that we are also part of the system that make a lot of arrangements from um, from other identities along our story, we are responsibly on that. We have responsibility on that. So, in this sense, we have we have a contradictory, many contradictory arguments against trans people, and we have a lot of many um, non. For example, one thing that is important for now for for us is to have the activism united with, for example, anti-racist movements. Uh, anti -decolonial, decolonial movements, etc., because this is also part of the system, intersectional system that we have to decompose. Because this idea of studying only gender itself as a, a, a thing that is isolated from the rest, sometimes it gives us um, bad illusions about the, the oppression that people suffer. Um, and for example, when this, uh, for example, we have a, a, a noun political person from, from the, a party that at this moment moved from for this party to a uh, right-wing party. And it was a person that uh, created a lot of ideas about LGBT uh, questions and problems and issues. But at this moment, she moved to a far-right um, party. So we question where is the people, the people that are helping us, if they are her already helping us. Because if this is critical, when we saw that people that are pro LGBT, they are moved, they are, they are moving for X and right parties where they are against LGBT people. 
and that is dangerous and, and difficult. So one thing that I feel is that uh, we have to push more, and this, this is more uh, an idea to push more the academia to be on the field, because sometimes we feel that we are a little alone. Uh, we because we feel that that sometimes uh, people on the on bases are fighting a lot, but sometimes we are alone because the academia don't touch the the base ground. It's like being somewhere, and, and that is difficult. And in that in that in that sense, it's important to to have like for example this this type of conference and talks that we can put people touching academia and also the the ground base. So some movements, because this is very important to, to evolve with the, the, the ideas and to, to evolve to the discussion, with the discussion. And um, another thing that is important is, for example, uh, that we have to, we are trying to impose, not impose, it's not the best word, but to clarify that people have their own um, wishes for their bodies, for their identities, etc. And this is a very hard process inside the, the, the medical community uh, because um, they have a lot of um, uh, uh, stereotypes around people, how they be, should behave, how they should stay. And this, this leads to a state of complete arrangement of trans people. So more than being visible is that, like, is that we are heroes from the story. From the history, and this is an important st step because sometimes we, when we talk about uh, visibility, we are talking about putting trans people on many places, on academia, on on medical sources, on etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we talk about harassment, we are talking about people that tries to go there, but they are completely going down because people don't accept them as a as a person to work there that in that place. Uh, I, for example, I have a personal a personal experience. For example, I can take myself to a, a post graduation on, on sexology, and I was refused because one chair, one discipline that was quantum mechanics, and it was very like why. Um, and in that sense, I think that um, it's important, uh, very important, to make uh, ourselves um, consciousness with consciousness that. Uh, the future uh, have to be disconstructed, and this is not this is not a task only for trans people. This is a task for everyone, because sometimes cis people tends to understand to don't question that they are also creating a gender. So cis people also have a gender. So this when we, when we try to resolve these two questions, we are trying to resolve a problem with systemic problem and the, and the structural problem, not only a problem for these specific people that are that, that are trans. And for example, when we talk about this, um, it's important to, to, to understand, for example, if someone, um, if we reject the idea of trans people exist, we are also rejecting the, the, the idea of cis people exist also, because uh, all people construct their, their um, gender in the top of the society that we have. So in the end, uh, it's important to understand that, um, and I think I'm talking a lot of fast. fast. <laughs> uh, it's important to understand that, um, let me slow down a little while. Uh, that's the idea of um, being trans inclusive is not the idea of only having, for example, that this happens a lot of on this type of movements that have, that is to have a person to make, to make them a token for their own services and their, their own choices. So, for example, we saw many movements, uh, collective movements in, in Portugal that, for example, they have only a, a trans person, say, being man or a woman or a non-binary person, but only to say, I have a trans person. So we are trans feminists and we are on top of this, so we are the right. But inside the collective itself, they don't have any political statements or any political movements that brings the place to be a real, a real inclusive one. And for example, when you discuss this inside the, the movements, it's very hard because uh, they are a little uh, frozen uh, because 
they think that maybe these questions are not important as at all because we have a person that does all the job, but uh, we have to have the notion that, for example, for us to organize, for our association to organize a lot of campaign, uh, et cetera, we need a lot of support. And this support should come by people that have privilege, mainly, because we cannot put all the people uh, that are less privileged in the top, in the front of the line uh, to the violence that mo most of the movements came to us. So I think that near this point should be the privileged people to get more uh, insights about themselves and fight a lot more to be a good ally, not replacing the voice of trans people, because sometimes that happens a lot, and uh, to push forward some things because they can. For example, I, I am a trans person, I'm a trans woman on binary, but for example, I have a, um, I have a normal job, I have incoming. So for example, for me, it's my, my social responsibility to push more because I can do it, because I have that space to do it. And it's important that privileged people, cis people start to do that job that by themselves also. Like for example, if we have, if we have groups for um, discussing toxic masculinity in, in, in groups of men, why you don't have groups of cis people talking about, discussing about cis sexism, and six uh, normativity and etc. So maybe we should change the the, the paradigm of way of looking at the problems and not only talk about the suffering of the trans people, but also talking why the cis people are aggressive with trans people. What is the problem? Why we don't study uh, why the transphobia exists, or, or why is the reflection on the cis people for having to see this so type of violence against trans people, because we, we shoot our forces against trying to know what is the problem with trans person, why is the, why is the suffering, et cetera, et cetera. We, but we don't study cis people. In, in that time, I think that is important to change this perspective because we cannot put always the, the, the value in top of the trans people as, as the person that should make the difference, should make everything because we are Super, super versing the system, so we should have the responsibility to change the system. But we don't have to have that responsibility because we already pass a lot during our days. So all of the people should have that obligation also to disconstruct the system and uh, up us to go forward with our our dreams because we are people like, like others. We have dreams, we have feelings, we have emotions. So we need that space. Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniela. So uh, we move on. Um, now we have uh, Camille Maksuga, LGBT activist from Krakow in Poland, nominated for the Sakharov Prize as a co-founder of Atlas of Eight, member of the Equal Signs uh, Federation and currently advocating for anti-slap regulations. So thank you, Camille. Welcome. And whenever you want, you can start. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for introducing me. Um, so yes, my work recently were focused more on uh, the project Atlas of Hate, which uh, was monitoring an um, anti-LGBT resolution in Poland. Um, I would like to start with a brief um description about the situation of lgbt people in poland lgbt rights there's uh, not a lot to be discussed uh but um yes yeah, so nothing has changed actually for many many years there was no significant positive change um in poland in regards to lgbt rights so we do still not have uh, civil partnerships and we do not have marriage equality. Um, there is no recognition of marriage, marriage um, between a same sex couple that were taken abroad. But there is one specific uh, case where this is important. So in order you want to have um, a marriage, heterosexual marriage in Poland, then it is valid your marriage from the, from abroad but in any other cases then uh, means nothing in poland we do not have um 
anti-discrimination law, which will help us a lot because of the recent um, anti-LGBT campaigns in Poland. And what I want to highlight is um, how the transition looks like in Poland, because I think that this is um, very country specific. Um, so if a trans person wants to make a change in their legal documentation, they need to sue their own parents. And it doesn't matter if they're in good relation, but if they are still talking, if the person is grown up, um, still needs to sue their own parents that at the very beginning, they assign them the wrong gender. Um, so recently, the, the critical point for um, LGBT movement was in 2019 and 2020. It started uh, about March 2019. Um, as we were chosen, uh, we, I mean, LGBT people were chosen as a uh, target, uh, targeted enemy for the election campaign. So, and uh, the very first campaign actually that uh, we were the public enemy was the election for the European Parliament. Um, and they, there was, um, there was like a massive movement from a lot of sides, like the key factors for these events was, um, of course, a Polish Catholic Church. We heard a lot of, um, even from the uh, like arch archbishops that, well, we are the rainbow plaque, uh, that we want to destroy families and so on. Um, but also uh, we have the well-organized fundamentalist organizations, which very often receive the public funding. And uh, other key factors for, for this change was also politicians um, or state-sponsored media or the government media. Uh, because our public media are um, belongs to the government, and uh, that's why it's easy to operate them by the ruling party. So um, by saying that our uh, fundamentalist organization, anti-gender, anti-LGBT organizations, are well funded by um, the, our government, I need to say that uh, well, the main person that's very supportive for uh, those organizations is our Minister of Justice. And there's a, there's a fund um, that there's a fund that's supposed to be for the victims of the legal system. So um, in case legal system, when something wrong, there's a budget for a recovery and so on. And this budget was used for anti-LGBT campaigns. Um, and um, other politicians that were very important in this, uh, it's the main, like the great example that in Poland, the best way to promote um, yourself as a politician, you need to be homophobic as uh, Przemysław Czarnek, he was um, voivodeship, so like the chair of the local area, and uh, he started to promote the anti-LGBT resolution in local municipalities in Poland. Uh, because of this, he was elected as a member of parliament, and right now he's the minister of education. Um, so easy, just you need to be homophobic and you can make a career in a Polish uh, uh, politi uh, political um, career. Um, so in this 2018, in March, there was, um, yeah, so first part was the state, uh, was the uh, fundamentalist organization uh, election campaign. 
and uh, state-sponsored media actually uh, started to print the stickers that are saying that this area is free from LGBT. And um, this like brings an idea to the politicians that we should do it and the local municipalities started to announce themselves as free from so-called LGBT ideology and I need to explain one thing because you probably are familiar with the term gender ideology this was this is very popular in uh, in our part of Europe but Poland actually um, it's not working because they were threatening us with gender ideology for so long that and people actually didn't see any threat so they need to change this ideology to LGBT ideology. And it's a very safe term for them because they can say that they are against this ideology, not against the people. And um, when one of the, because in this 2019, 2020, we had actually three political campaigns. So there was European Parliament, parliamentary elections and um, presidential. And also our current president used, um, used an opportunity to say that um, LGBT are not people, this is just an ideology, this is a quote. And um, yeah, so other fundamentalist organization mm, try to use this fuel as much as they can. So we had on our streets on, in a, a lot of cities, anti-LGBT um, people trucks, we call it homophobe bus, um, but because it's, it's, it's going around the towns, it has a megaphone and it's saying basically that LGBT people are pedophiles that want to destroy your family and so on. It is very difficult to hard to listen to this, and as we do not have the anti-discrimination law against our uh, minority, then mm, police actually were protecting this truck from stopping. Because I've seen even the older people that were trying to stop this truck, and police uh, arrested this uh, old couple. And there was also a massive billboard campaign against an um, LGBT as um, it's very similar as in Hungary, what we have heard uh, that we were in this um, narrative, we were, well, narrative was framed as a, you know, protecting of the family rights, Christian traditions um, to protect the children. Um, so, um, and unfortunately, it works. And um, there is also a new tool. Uh, okay, but maybe first I will say more about those uh, anti LGBT resolutions. So since March 2019, uh, there was like hundreds, uh, hundreds, more than 100 resolutions in like uh, communes, counties cities and uh, and so on on the different administrative levels declaration that this area is free from lgbt they will not support any actions or so on and the narrative was like to protect the children to protect the tradition and so on um so um it spreads uh, very quickly i'm sure that mark will say more about the what uh, was uh, the answer from the European um, Parliament. Uh, but actually, because of our allies um, from all over the world, we managed to force them to resign from uh, some of the anti-LGBT resolutions. So there, there are less and less rights now. Um, but um, there's very brand new tool that is using against the LGBT activists in Poland. This is a uh, slaps. Uh, so this is a strategic lawsuit against the public participation. So for example, in the case of Atlas of Hate, we were um, sued by 
seven local municipalities uh, for the defamation of them, because it's not important what they pass, that this is homophobic and so on, but they receive a backlash and um, we need to take the penalty for this. And it doesn't matter in that, that, that cases if we are going to lose a win. It's about to threat activists to, to freeze their actions um, to prevent them for any further success and also to exhaust us. Because in last, in, well, following two or three years, I will spend battling in court for seven cases explaining the same um, that, um, well, I was just um, pointing everything what you have passed on the map in the internet. Um, also, the, the new tools are the fake news about the activists, um, or there are uh, troll farms that are spreading those fake, new, fake news, and those fake news are very um, disgusting. And um, so to summarize, like being an L LGBT activist in Poland is quite difficult. And also you need to fight right now more to resist than to progress anything. And I remind you that we still do not have like a progress in our law. And yes, you need to be ready for the, all the fake news, um, legal cases and threats that you can receive. And the threats are not going only to you, but also to your family. So it's a very hard decision. Um, and a lot of activists decided to stop their work because of their families, friends. But there is a hope. So um, LGBT community in Poland have strong allies, like European Parliament, European Commission, international politicians, activists, people across the world. And our community is also stronger than ever. Um, because of all of those bad things that happened, a lot of activists, made something in a very small town for the very first time. So it was like uh, very empowering for them. It was there um, to start something new. And uh, they were brave enough to talk in very uh, difficult areas. Um, in Poland, except all of those, uh, what happens and because of uh, the map uh, from in, um, ILGA that um, went recently that Poland is still um, worst uh, country in the European Parliament when it comes to LGBT rights. With uh, anyway, we have more and more prize and prize participants in Poland each year. There are prizes in a very 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 small um, but very uh, symbolic places. Um, and we are doing what we can. And um, we were able to fight back those um, anti-LGBT resolutions, so-called LGBT free zones. And uh, also, we have more supporters than ever because of also, because of what happened um, of those, all of those bad things that happened. Um, let's say the people from the middle decided like change to support us. So there were a lot of people that were saying that LGBT uh, topic is not that important, but they have seen that uh, it's important to fight for, this, for, the, for our rights, for LGBT rights, and um, we need their support as well in this fight. So um, with this positive accent, um, I would like to end. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Camille. Um, now we move on. And now, and last but not least, we have Mark Angel uh, with, with, with us. We want to 
thank for his willingness to participate in this uh, roundtable. Um, and I will introduce briefly too. So uh, he's a member of LGBTI intergroup and uh, a member of the initiative LGBTI Freedom Zone, member of the European Parliament since December 2019. He became co-president of the LGBTI intergroup in January 2020 and Mark has over um, 25 years of HIV AIDS advocacy and was appointed UNAIDS champion for the 1990-90 target. He's a member on the committees on employment and social affairs and petitions and is substitute in the committees on economic and monetary affairs internal market and consumer protection and special committee on beating cancer. He's a member of the delegation to the Euro Latin American Parliamentary Assembly and delegation of the European uh, Union Chile Joint Parliamentary uh, Committee and substitute in the delegation for relations with the People's Republic of China. Welcome, Mark Angel. And you can start whenever you want. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to this interesting uh, conversation. We have to resist the campaigns against gender ideology. And I was very happy to hear Daniela and Bea and Camille. Camille is a good friend. Uh, and uh, because uh, if we want to resist and combat the gender movement, we need civil society. And you've seen uh, what they explained us in, in Hungary, how strong they were to make a, a referendum invalid. So it's very important. And also, every time I go to Poland and I see this rich civil society, these rich activists, rich in, in ideas, unfortunately underfunded, and then we are all fighting to get them more, uh, to get EU European funds more accessible to them. But they are very rich in creativity. They are very rich in, in ideas and in, in, in also in legal knowledge. And this is important. And I'm happy also that uh, this is the university, the academic world who, who organizes this conference, because it's if we want to combat the anti-gender movement, we can only do it uh, uh, in joining forces, the uh, the civil society, the activists, lawmakers like me, politicians, but also the academics, uh, you, because you are very important in collecting data uh, uh, and, and research work, and 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 this is uh, of utmost importance. So I'm very happy to participate in this, and I think this is a very good setting. The anti-gender movement is unfortunately a very well financed, and they are rich. The anti-gender movement, sponsored of course by American evangelicals, by the by, by sources close to, to the Kremlin and, 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 and many others, and, uh, and they are very well organized and they are infiltrating everywhere. Um, there has been a study by my green colleague here in the European Parliament, Vice President Heidi Hagtula from Finland. She, she makes, she has, every five years, she makes this report on the anti-gender movement in the European Union. And uh, it's very, I can only recommend it to you. You Google her, you find her, you Google Heidi Hautala and then anti-gender movement, and then you find her. And it says that since 2016, those politicians in the European Parliament who, who defend these anti-gender ideas uh, are, are up to have doubled, and there's about 30% of the members uh, who, who defend that. On the other, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, um, I wanted to explain to you first of all what is the LGBTI intergroup in the European Parliament. You know, the European Parliament is made out of 705 members from the 27 member states, and um, we have committees which are official bodies of the of the uh, of the Parliament. But then there is also intergroups. It's like um, caucuses, meetings, and the LGBTI intergroup is the biggest intergroup of 157 members. And of course, uh, they are, we don't have 100. 157 members of the LGBTI community in the parliament, but they are allies, and this is so very important to have these allies. And we, through this allyship, we are able to, to amend texts. We are present in all committees. We, there's always one of us working on a resolution, and, and then we we'll always try to put uh, inclusive language in the resolutions and also put a look at the angle of. of, of um, of, of LGBTI rights, and not only in, in human rights related issues, or, or but also sometimes in very technical ones. Uh, 
for example, um, I give you an example, the law on Hung um, um, Bea explained us the law in Hungary, this terrible law, it obliges a children's book where there is a content of LGBTI, they have to be marked and put in plastic uh, like a porn magazine in a shop. It's, it's really scandalous. And, and I think this is an infringement to the, this is uh, not, um, this is um, violating the single market rules and the free movement of, and I put an amendment in a, in a report on this. So we can, we, we find many, many different points where we can counter, where we can, where we can help to, uh, to, to, to push LGBTI, uh, LGBTI rights. Um, it's important uh, to have intergroups and we are promoting also that national parliaments should, should have these intergroups to work together with civil society and academia to do also uh, to also push the LGBTI agenda on the on the uh, national level because the European level is quite restricted. We have some powers, we have our treaties, but uh, we 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 cannot we cannot do everything, and um, and therefore it's important to have such intergroups in also all our national uh, parliaments. Poland has one uh, which is very active, and I hope there will be more in other other parliaments. There is also now um, in the Council of Europe, uh, at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which came, which founded an LGBTI intergroup, they already have a very, very active uh, uh, group uh, of, of parliamentarians defending sexual and reproductive health rights. It's an uh, Austrian uh, member of parliament, Petra Bayer, which is very, very active in that. And um, it's important that we, 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 we do this work because uh, in the European Union, I give you a very concrete example, the word gender and the word intersectional discrimination tends to disappear from 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 the council language, not from the commission and the parliament. In the parliament, we are we are very we are very, very active on this, and the commission also with Commissioner Helena Dali. But it's often in in documents from the council. I'll give you a very concrete example: the Porto summit last year, this big social summit. Um, they had to to negotiate very late at night just to get the word gender out. And then, uh, in order to have Poland and Hungary signing it, they had to talk about equality between men and women, and they couldn't use the word gender. You see how far this goes, and this influence is, is, is very big of, uh, of the Polish and the Hungarian government. To tell you that there can be some light in the end of the tunnel is that I was very active in the conference on the future of Europe. This was a conference where 800 citizens took part, and uh, which which was in the beginning a very abstract uh, uh, thing, but then uh, when the citizens came with their very proposals and all components came together in working groups in Strasbourg, there was a very good result of 325 very concrete measures, and I was very happy. And some of the measures the treaty change, treaty change in the European Union. And why do we need treaty change also when it comes to LGBTI rights? Because the ground of a gender identity is not a legal ground in our discrimination legislation, in the treaties even. Therefore, it's also important that we go in that direction, that we, we change the, the treaties, not only, of course, for LGBTI people, but for, for many other reasons. The citizens wanted, for example, more competences in the European Union in health policies. Uh, if the European Union needs more competence in health policies, to make uh, people's lives easier, then uh, we need to change the treaties, and then, of course, we can also look at the perspective of of uh, of the of the of, of the rights of LGBTI people, because now Europe cannot dictate countries to have a law against uh, against uh, um, uh, forced sterilization when they change uh, when they change uh, a gender. We cannot force uh, 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 countries to to uh, go on the way, as, as the Commission LGBTI strategy says, depathologization and, and self-determination when it comes to gender recognition. So um, therefore, maybe uh, I, I now profit from this occasion that we, we, we should uh, uh, support uh, President Macron, who said, yes, we need some treaty change to, to make Europe move on better. And also, the biggest, uh, what citizens wanted, to get rid of unanimity. You know, in the council for certain policy areas, we need unanimity. And as it as 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 we see, it's often Hungary, often Poland, who block things. You know, we have a 
and horizontal anti-discrimination directive blocked in the European Council since 2008. That's almost 14 years now because a few countries block it. If we would get rid of this unanimity principle, we could have a, a horizontal anti-discrimination directive where, where we could protect uh, minorities such as uh, LGBTI minorities in all areas of life. For the moment, we have this directive only when it comes to employment. And, and, uh, and therefore, I think um, it's important to, to think about uh, also treaty change. Not treaty change, just to have treaty change. But, and this, the same people uh, who are also the conservative, very conservative uh, far right is they say, oh, why do you bother people with treaty change? That's not interesting for their lives. But when people understand that if Europe has, can help them, that there needs a treaty change, if you put it in relation, then I think people, people will, will, uh, will understand this. Um, I was also going to say a few words that we are very strong in the European Parliament on defending sexual and uh, 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 sexual reproductive health rights, of course, but also sexual education and um, and uh, relationship education, which is so important. And uh, 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 and you know the laws in Hungary, uh, the anti-LGBTI propaganda law, uh, which forbids. I call it uh, the Russian style because it's copy cut paste from the Russian law and the Polish copied it and the, now in Romania and the Senate they also copied that law and, and, and voted it. It was a, a, a Romanian uh, member of parliament, very conservative from the Hungarian minority who brought it in and it passed. And this is things we really have to be careful what happens in, in, our, in our member states and, uh, and again uh, therefore maybe Europe cannot always intervene again we need a treaty change but i will stop with the treaty change now and i will come uh, to a few other subjects i already mentioned the um the um the um a, a sexual and uh, education which is very important also all europe doesn't have competences in education we're trying in our resolutions in the Parliament to really uh, to really uh, defend that. We're also defending. Uh, finally, we're fighting, and I hope this will be realized soon. That the European Union, as a union, will ratify the Lisp the um, the Istanbul Convention. I don't have to tell you what the Istanbul Convention is. Um, and there, there was also now a, a, a judgment from the European Court of Justice that we don't need unanimity to ratify it. And I really hope that now this convention is 11 years old, that we finally ratify uh, this uh, this convention. And uh, but again, it's uh, these anti-gender uh, people who 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 support uh, the countries like Poland to leave the convention, or who 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 refuse, who, who make who make um, pressure on politicians on national level and also on European level not to ratify. Uh, to fight this so um, it is important that we really unite our forces to combat uh, this 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 movement um, we as the uh, intergroup also uh, monitor that for example there was a polish uh, member of the economic uh, economic and uh, social committee who wanted to become become in in the economic and um, social committee, there is a group which deals with uh, with gender and diversity, and there was a member of uh, Ordo Iuris, which is the Polish branch of the um, the Polish branch of the anti-gender movement, who wanted to to join that movement. So we intervened, and we were successful. So sometimes we do very mini actions also. Mafalda, you mentioned in your introductory speech something which was very interesting that we uh, should not only combat the anti-gender movement in, uh, in, in Europe but uh, in other geographies and I think here we can um, join forces with Latin American countries. I'm also a member, as you mentioned, of the Eurolat Parliamentary Assembly and if you see uh, uh, Argentina, what's happening now in Chile, countries who are very, very progressive too on, on this, we should use them as allies and, and push the agenda also on the um, multilateral and, and, and uh, United Nations level. On the other hand, in Latin America, we have one of the biggest supporters of the anti-gender movement, which is President Bolsonaro from, uh, from uh, Brazil. So uh, I think it's important that uh, European countries work together with Latin American countries to also counter this uh, this uh, this uh, anti anti gender movement. I just have a few notes here of things which I want 
wanted to say yes um, before I was, I wanted to tell you two stories. Before I was a member of the European Parliament, I was a member of the National Parliament in, in, in Luxembourg. Now Luxembourg is a country very Catholic, not known as the most progressive country, but we managed to uh, vote the two laws, the um, same-sex marriage, with 57 members of parliament out of 60 who voted in favor. We managed that also the Conservative Party uh, voted for it. We managed also a, a, a law on legal gender recognition. And here, the Transgender uh, Activists Association in Luxembourg was very clever. You know, politicians are afraid of activists. Um, and, uh, and that's why, and that, that's also a sort of uh, homophobia or transphobia. Uh, but then the trans activists in Luxembourg, they brought the families to the political parties, the families, the children, the work colleagues, the brothers and the sisters. And this was uh, a very good strategy because um, then, uh, uh, especially the, uh, my colleagues from the more conservative parties, they realized, well, this can this this is, it can happen to all of us to have an intersex child or a, a, a trans child and and we have to support uh, 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 trans people and that and and we could talk about sexuality also to get this rid of this taboo to talk about sex you know uh, and, and all these confusions uh, uh, that people don't know that. Uh, they don't make the difference, uh, not only people, but politicians don't only make the difference between uh, sexual orientation and sexual identity. There is so many uh, uh, wrong ideas. And, and um, I learned that from, from, from as an AIDS activist, you, you wouldn't believe that many politicians do have no clue. They think AIDS is the same as 30 years ago. They have never heard of PrEP or PEP, all this. They have never heard, they, they have never heard that you can live uh, uh, um, if you're on treatment, that you're, the virus can be undetectable. All this progress made uh, is unknown because, again, AIDS is linked to sex and all this is taboo. So I think it's, it's very important that, that, um, that, um, that uh, universities and, 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 and gender studies, sexualities, that that is a, a subject, sexualities in all the broader sense, in plural as you use it. I think this is a uh, very, very important. I think I have spoken enough because I, I would like to have time for questions uh, and have a debate with you. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, it's going to be two tough days with Ida Hobbit, but actually we should talk all year about these subjects. Tomorrow, if you have time, I will be participating in a Facebook Live with uh, the President of the European Parliament, Mrs. Roberta Metzola, and my Green colleague, who is the other co-chair of the intergroup, Terry Reinke, and in the afternoon I have another meeting with the uh, UNAIDS, which is organized uh, together with UNAIDS, and there um, we will also talk, address the situation of, of, of um, the refugees from, um, from Ukraine. You know, there's still a big problem. Trans uh, women, trans women from Ukraine with male gender markers, they are not allowed to leave the border. Uh, they cannot leave uh, the Ukraine. And um, there's, and this is also issues we have to address. And another thing where I'm very active in, and I try to fight for that. And and um, Daniela mentioned uh, discrimination in health in healthcare settings. Um, there is a global co a global coalition, a global partnership uh, uh, against HIV uh, discrimination and stigmatization. And yes, there is no European country member of that because we as Europeans think that we are so good that there is no discrimination in our health settings. And I think it's high time that we as Europeans will also join that. Um, my country has already committed. It looks like Spain is also uh, interested in, 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 in joining. And then we have to convince the European Commission also to join this uh, global partnership. And, um, and often uh, activism, AIDS activism, then opens doors for other 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 minorities and other uh, other active other you know if we fight against uh, uh, HIV discrimination in, in in health settings this can also help trans people etc uh, and and others and I think um, uh, th this is also a subject which is uh, quite uh, quite important but having said that now time I give the floor back to Mafalda. And, um, and, and thank you again for inviting me. And um, whenever one of you is in Brussels, 
don't hesitate to come and see me in the European Parliament. I will introduce you to my colleagues who work on these issues. And, uh, you know, this is an open house. Uh, now, after COVID, we can have guests again. So don't hesitate and come and visit us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark Angel, um, for such wonderful presentation and also for signing such relevant um, issues and for the, the invitation to go to Brussels.